when I set together this talk, um, I figured out. Let's move over here. What a shitty talk title this is. I mean, seriously, combining the minds of Agile, Lean, and a waterfall to build great games. I mean, that's probably the longest talk title I ever had. <laughs> so let's simplify this. That's my message. Use waterfall. Sometimes. Um, maybe maybe I have to give some background to this. Well, actually, I I'm a true believer of Agile values. Um, and 15 years ago, I was working on a project in Düsseldorf uh, as a freelancer for six months at a bank, the Westdeutsche Landesbank. That's a state-owned bank. That's a, that's a bank where public servants, so Beamte, are in charge of the bank. It was the most terrible, terrifying work experience I had in my life. It was a disaster. But there was one good thing. Throughout the lunch break, I could go down to a bookshop. And I found this book. Someone know this? Uh, Extreme Programming Explains. I think this was even before the Agile Manifesto, somewhere around that time. Um, so this is uh, explaining, so this, this book is introducing Extreme Programming, one of the very early Agile methodologies. Um, and in it, it describes a lot of good practices for developers. It's kind of like uh, describing why iterative development makes sense, why test coverage makes sense, why pair programming makes sense. That all comes from this one book. And it has one subtitle, Embrace Change. So basically, it was setting up some rules for developers to protect them, I would say, against people who would later be called product owners. Uh, but on the other side, it demands from us developers to embrace change. So changing internal priorities, if you learn something, adjust to that. And building a whole methodology around that to make that happen. So, and since I read this book 15 years ago, I become, became a true believer of Agile. But um, 15 years later at Vuga, um, I also learned something that there are some limits to this, and sometimes maybe waterfall is the right approach. And this is what the talk is about. But who am I? I mean, coming to, to this meetup and telling you waterfall, OK, that uh, takes some guts. Um, uh, first of all, I'm a developer. Um, I started as a developer 20 years ago. Um, throughout the last five, six years, I've mostly more worked as a manager, but my mindset is truly that of a developer. So for me, Agile is a lot about having a contact between developers, so the, the things, the people who do things, and product people like you who tell us what we should do. Um, so, and, and to find a kind of like rule set uh, between the, the two groups of that. Um, so this is, this is one of the mindsets. The second one I have is uh, that throughout the last four years, I worked as a product owner for one team. So I had to cross the chasm to the other side. So maybe I should sit down there somewhere and learn that mm, maybe it's not that simple on the other side as well. Actually, I found my role as product owner more challenging than as a scrum master. At least they had some rules that what I should do, and product owner was a bit like, ooh. Um, so this gives me two perspectives on the whole thing. And the last one is that at Fuga, I'm actually, uh, I stopped working there last week ago, but for seven years, I had been head of engineering at Fuga, which allows me also to talk a bit more freely. Um, and as head of engineering, the last thing I did was to rework the overall development process of the company. And it was this uh, retrospective of how we have been developing games for the last six, seven years that led me to the change that sometimes waterfall might be the right approach, at least the mindset of it. So Vuga, what is that? We make games like this. This was the first game I worked on, um, or like this. If you want to know more about this brilliant game, go to Zeta. She knows all about it. Uh, she's working on that game. Um, or a game like this, Time Dash. These are all casual games, um, and nowadays mostly on mobile. And what makes um, Vuga as a company of us that makes product that makes games special is that for each and every game, we have a dedicated team. So each team is responsible for one game only, and it has complete responsibility for that game. 
So it's uh, cross-functional. You have product people in there. Uh, you have artists in there. You have development in there. And they go through the whole life cycle of the game, uh, even up until to operation. So the same team that created the game later is responsible for operating the game while it's live. That means the team has a lot of autonomy. Um, so the game, how we see Huga, is a bit more like, like an investor in startup. It's more like a venture capital company. And each team that makes one game is kind of like a new startup, starting a product from scratch without any dependencies to other teams that are in the company. So um, each of these teams is a profit loss center. So we uh, value the success of a team by how much money does, did it make over the life cycle of the whole game. Um, that also means that the product lead in that team has a very strong role, it basically acts as the CEO of that company and has all the permissions for priority scheduling and basically has the final word of what happens in the team. There are some limits. We put some more constraints into it over the last years, but basically this is a very strong role. And this product lead essentially is the product owner. So the product owner has to say what happens to the team and which priority, at least from my developer's perspective. Um, that means uh, the team or the product it has the final word on game design, so what game is actually built, um, what technologies are used. This is probably delegated to people in the team and also like things like art style and things like that. And what makes things interesting is that for each and every game, uh, we just start up a new team. And these teams are independent of each other. That makes the whole company a very interesting experimentation ground because at some time we had more than 20 of these teams running in parallel in the different phases of a life cycle. So, and the life cycle is um, um, maybe a bit, actually I think it's universal, but it's, uh, let's see if it's universal. So this is what most game companies have. Um, you start with some kind of concept, you want to build a game that looks like this. Uh, it's probably, I don't know, a two page PowerPoint presentation or something. Um, then you go to prototyping and you build that stuff. You put things together. It's a very wide exploitation ground and you see if it works or what does not work before you then start to build it. And building then means the team scales up to 20, sometimes 30 people. In some cases, like Bots Pro, then adds 15 other outsourcing people on it. So 80 people working on the same thing. Whereas in concepting, it maybe was one or two persons. So the team size varies a lot over the life cycle. Um, and once you finish the product, then you put it out live on test market, which you call a soft launch. So we basically put this game out live in one country to see if it works. We iteratively approve on that game to decide if you make a global launch or not. And if the game is good enough, then you make a global launch. This is live. And then we start earning money before you just invest it. Um, and at some time, so the first game I showed, we shut down two months ago. So after some time, the product life cycle is over. We shut down the game. That's it. Um, one more thing for Vuga is we make mobile games. And mobile games or mobile free-to-play games, financed by microtransaction means this is the formula we live by. Um, do you know what this means? LTV has to be bigger than eCPI. Yeah. We are a metrics-driven company a lot. So LTV, that's lifetime value. So basically that's how long does a player keep playing the game and how much money do they spend on average? So maybe it's $2 for a free-to-play game. They do not pay anything to download the game. We just hope that some of them will spend some money later on. And CPI is the cost per install. So the thing is, uh, for mobile games, um, normal marketing channels don't really work. So you do a targeted advertisement for users. And you pay maybe about $2 to get one user to install your game. And the E then means, OK, maybe they bring some friends. So if they bring some friends, then the average value then is maybe $1.50 uh, for every user that we get, which would mean for every user, we make a whopping 50 cent revenue. Multiply this by 50 million users, and you made $25 million. That's our business model. The thing here is, and why I'm telling this, is that it has a profound effect on this life cycle. Because once we go to, uh, before we go to soft launch, we don't get any user feedback. We cannot do MVPs or anything like that. Uh, because when you put an incomplete game to our users, 
they will just not play it. We will not be able to measure the lifetime value because the game is not complete yet, or we do not know how costly it is to install that because we don't have this effect. Which means for us, after we did the prototype, we are pretty much committed to finishing that game to state that it's competitive on the market, so we can only ship complete products. So, this led us to uh, some problems, and I want to talk about one that is, uh, or two things we tried out. One is the concept that might also be interesting to you, I hope, is uh, called the hit fitter, which is something that we try to cope with this environment. And uh, I would like to talk to you about like what that means. Um, and later on, then talk about how we changed that in the development process over the, the last year, so to speak. So when we do mobile games, the problem in the mobile games market for us is um, maybe they launch something like 1,000 new games every week. That's a lot. That's probably an underestimation because that number is old. It's a highly competitive market. But it's also a lucrative market for a few selected games. So this is, can you read that? This number is $2.5 million revenue for every day. And these are kind of like the games. So this is a top one game. I think the top one game is something like three, four. It's a digital good, so you don't pay anything for it. That's pure profit that you get more or less. Um, but then this curve goes pretty much down. And here you are in the top 50. Then you maybe have $20,000 a day, which is still some sizable money. And then it trades off to a very, very long tail. The point is, if you have to invest a few million to make a game, if you're on the right side, you're losing money. It's an extremely hit-driven market. Either you are hit or you are dead. It's that simple. But if you have a hit, you can print money and you can do whatever you want. And we had a few hits in the past and uh, uh, it's very nice to be up there. So in the past, when we started the company, uh, basically we started a project and then we were committing to bring it to an end. So we started a game project and brought it to launch in the end. Um, but then in 2013, something happened. So we were pretty successful all the time. We had one half other than another, and we were basically printing money. Really nice office and all that. And then we had five launches, I think in 2013, something like three, four years ago. And all of these games did cost a shitload of money because all of them were bought in production for something like two years with large teams, and four out of five completely flopped. Um, they just didn't work on the market at all. One, that's Pearl Sparrow, that's Theta's game, um, then kept the company afloat. But four out of five failed. And we thought to ourselves, that, that can't be a good way to run a business, right? We invest in each of these games a few million, I think five, six million for the most expensive one, and they completely failed. Um, and the one thing is that there were already people in the company who said, we should have stopped this earlier. I don't have a good feeling about that. It's not like you put it on the market and then suddenly you realize, oh, this, this doesn't fly. You probably have 80% of people or 90% of people in the company who say like, ah, so this won't fly. But still we plowed on because we committed ourselves. So the realization is that we should have stopped earlier before we spent the whole of the money. Um, so we changed our process. Instead of every game that we started put to launch, we started to question ourselves regularly. We did something that we, that we brought from Pixar, where they have this brain trust process, which is about candid feedback. So people from all over the company come together in a room. Every six weeks, we called it a review process, and basically said, like, we should continue or we should stop. And they really, literally started the discussion with this finger up and down, and then talked about whether they should continue or not. Um, and that uh, was quite okay. So the idea was there. The product lead in the team still had the final word to stop the project or not, but it was expected of him her, to, to listen to the feedback of the other people in the room. And when they didn't believe in the game anymore, they should stop it. Which meant basically disband the team of 50 people and start something over. The concept is two. So there are a lot of organization changes around that, but that's not so much part of the talk today. Um, so we ended up in a hit filter like this. So these are basically the phases that I talked about. So we had prototype production, soft launch, launch. Actually, I copied this from our website. It's still online. Um, 
So we thought like, okay, maybe we should have something like 40 prototypes a year, and we shut down 30 of them, and 10 we move into production, and then maybe, what is that? 70 put to soft launch and three games we can launch. And that's a good process. So basically, by this questioning earning, you have a funnel and filter out the games that were not going to become a hit because only hits are profitable. Um, let's check this is reality. Uh, so when I did this development process, I checked the numbers for 2014, 2015. And yeah, we had something like 75 concepts. So these one pager. But we managed to bring only 25 prototypes uh, in this. And out of these 25 prototypes, we had only five that were able to move to production. And out of these five, only two went to the soft launch, only one did a full launch, and that wasn't successful. So we had a really nice funnel, and the funnel is really a cool thing to do, and I think it's also the right thing to do. We didn't spend, we still did spend way too much money uh, on these games. Um, but at least not the whole amount for, for all of these projects. Um, but we never really tackled how we made better games with that. We just had a process to shut down games that were not going good enough. It's a bit like you put someone blindfolded in a room and then tell them to make some target practice and then he shoots around with a shotgun in the dark. And we thought like, hey, maybe if you put 20 people in the room, 20 game teams in parallel, someone will hit. No. <coughs> <coughs> so the promise we were having is, um, because we believed in our own cool aid, and we had this kind of like, someone made up this demo, you need 40 prototypes a year. 40 prototypes a year, we need 20 teams. So let's start 20 teams. Oh, we don't have 20 product leads. Okay, let's promote 15. So we had a lot of people uh, promoted in, in these teams and that led to basically these teams not being properly staffed, both by the number of people and the seniority of people that we had there. And we didn't have any hits. And part of that is this was all without any direction. So we uh, started our projects. If someone had a good idea and it would go through the review process, then it would be good enough. Let's do that. But that led to absolutely zero synergies between the game. You had not, if you tried out a genre that no one was else active in before, then you had to find out everything on your own by starting up. Didn't really work. Um, because we had no focus, we chased random opportunities. Someone had a great idea, let's do it. Um, but the biggest problem we had in this whole thing were huge delays. I'm talking about year-long releases. It's a bit like the uh, Berlin Airport and some of these projects. Uh, and part of that is that we, couldn't have, that we haven't put any constraints on the game teams. We didn't have any concept, for example, of budgets or when the game should be released. Because we said, every game is like a startup. The product lead has the last word. The product lead will do his best to make, bring out the game as cheap as possible, as quickly as possible, and that's good enough. Turned out, it really wasn't. Um, so some of these projects, I mean, you're talking about millions here. Um, we also had the problem that that's some of these phases, prototyping, so they all teams basically use the same kind of like agile rhythm, like with weekly or bi-weekly uh, iterations. And that really led to a very slow prototyping process. So we had teams that were over a year in prototyping before they finally made up their mind what kind of game they want to build. Um, and uh, But the biggest problem we had was more that once we entered production, um, we found out during production that the game is not good enough. Uh, but since we already committed itself, then we changed the product, we changed the requirements. Uh, this is not good enough. I have an idea how to make it better. And that led to six months or one year uh, extension of the production phase when the team was really big. And that was a huge money sink. So with this all in mind, um, starting with the development process here. Um, so end of last year, we did a strategy change. So one thing is kind of like, okay, this can't continue. We need to focus. Um, so we are simply not good enough in all genres over the world. So we just focus on three core key genres. 
you just concentrate on making puzzle games, on casual simulation games, and hidden object games. And basically, we did three out of 20 possible genres. And there were people are doing the same kind of game again, and the learnings could apply better, and you have more synergy effects of learning from each other. So teams are not depending on each other, but there's a lot of knowledge exchange between the teams, and this made it a lot more efficient. And we are slowly starting to see the first benefits of that. The second thing is we, yes, we had some improved something like budgets. Um, um, I always hated budgets, um, but I figured out it was the, the only way to go because it was completely overboard. Um, we never meant that the, the product lead has the last word was a saying that we had in, at Vuga. And we never meant that they could spend as many millions of dollars that they wanted to do. So we needed to put up some constraints. And some of them were budgets, and the second one was uh, clear gate meetings where this budget was approved. And that led to a different view on the process, no longer seeing it as a funnel, but more like, okay, what's the life cycle about? What happens when? So also the teams were except, did exactly know what, ex, what was expected of them. Um, so we would start with the standard concepting phase like before. So basically two people sit in the room finding out um, this is the game that you want to do. I think this is a market proposal. Um, then the team would grow a bit bigger, exploration, uh, which is basically exploring ideas, throwing away ideas, starting over, doing it again. And once they had something that I believe is a strong use piece and a unique selling proposition, this core, this idea is something that people will be excited about, then they fleshed out the rest of the game. Which could be... So basically we had some very good idea what the complete game will look about after this phase. And then we would sit together and make a commitment, or the company would make a commitment to the team, meaning we will finance this game. So you have another $3 million to build the game from now on. Um, but first, they wanted to see, like, okay, what is this game really about? So then you would enter a phase which just like pre-production, which is kind of like planning, upfront planning of how the production phase will look like, and tackling some risks. Um, some consultant who basically um, then to many companies setting up process, it calls it the de-risking phase. So basically, what are the risks that can make this project fail? Cover them now before you commit. Because then we enter production, then it's kind of like point of no return. And at this phase, the game is in a tunnel. There's no new learnings, no new feedback from anyone outside. And the next time we will get feedback is in soft launch, when you put the game out live. And if software is successful, then you put it live and then you start earning money. Now, the interesting thing is, um, me from a, from a manager perspective for the whole thing, looks at this not only as phases, but also like, okay, how many people do we need for how long in each of the phases? And they are very different. And thus, you also need a very different mindset in each of the phase. So you start out concepting is first table discussing, throwing, doing a lot of brainstorming, coming up with proposals to do that. Maybe that's something like two months. Maybe they start over, but at some time they have something that they maybe worked one or two months on. Um, and then they get maybe one developer and maybe a second game designer and maybe someone who does level balancing, whatever. Four people fleshing out the USP. What makes this game unique? What does it make stand out? What will make it successful on the market? And once they got to this point, um, uh, they have something, then we may be at second developer. Maybe the first artist comes on board so that we can really flesh out the whole thing. We have an idea of what the arts level look like and how the, the user experience will look like, things like that. Um, and after these eight months, um, that's a long time, but it was a very small team. Then comes this decision, okay, now we fundamentally commit to this one game. And then the mindset needs to change or needed to change because then Maybe we add a producer, someone who's more like a project manager to, to a team to flesh out what will happen then. But in production, then maybe the team goes up to 20 people, maybe 25 people. And then the team starts to cost a shitload of money every month. If you change your mind what the game should be in that phase, you're doomed. That is something we saw over and over and over again. And in soft launch, you still have these 20 persons, and maybe it takes about two months to get the first reliable data, the first cutoff point where, based on data, we see like this game will not fly. Um, let's let's put this in perspective and put some money on that. 
Um, so let's assume that every person costs something like $10,000 a month. Actually, it's not exact number, but it's this ballpark of number. So this is basically what you pay them a salary, then you pay social security on top, and some overhead costs like rent for the building and whatever. Um, and then in this example, this is something like 2.1 billion to building the game, which would be cheap. Um, but the interesting thing is, after the point of no return, before it's just 340,000 euros. So 15% of the total cost is before. Then you build the game for the 85% of the cost. Then you have something and then you start earning money. And the thing is, uh, for me, after talking to many people about that and seeing the mistakes you did in the past is that you need three very distinct mindsets, how you approach these, these development phases of this product. And the first phase, um, this is all about quick iterations. We made the mistake of following a standard scrum approach like VT iteration. That's too long. And <laughs> in this early phase, you should have iterations that take half a day or maybe every day. And I mean it. So the first weeks, if your iterations take longer than a day, you're doing it wrong. You're not fast enough. Um, that was a serious shift of mind to see kind of like, okay, get into this phase. It's very fast pain. This is probably too fast for any type of tooling to track progress or anything like that. Very quick, fast iteration. Um, multiple times a day getting together. And when this is not working, then throw it away. So it's a lot of pivoting in this, trying something out, being experimental, being wild in this. And if it doesn't fly, throw it out. So we do a lot of usability tests. So we bring in people from the street to, to, to even play paper prototypes. So we don't get any KPIs out of that that will tell us this game will be successful or not, but we get very inf important information. And there are also services like Playtest Cloud where we send people in our target market into the game. It looks like shit, but still we get some qualitative knowledge uh, if, if that works or not. And the key thing is the team is extremely small at that point. And it changes once we do this commitment, now we commit to building the game, and then we start spending a lot of money. And then it's more like following the plan. Up until this point, we already need to know what the game will look like when we release it. So at this point, it's about execution. Getting through this phase where we are burning money every day at an enormous rate, as quickly as possible. There is no time to experiment in that phase. And most important, there are no new learnings because we already had a very extensive prototype where we spent more than half a year on, so we know what the product will look like, and we do not have any user feedback. There is no feedback loop in, in that sense on a high level, on the small details, of course, and it's a very large team. This team, of course, uses something like iterations, like weekly iterations, retrospective sprint planning on the, on the execution level, but it's kind of like every item in the backlog gets more refined but not changed. And also the priority does not change anymore in that phase. That is locked. Um, and once we are alive, once we get out of this tunnel, then we can start breathing again. Uh, and then it's standard, classic, uh, iterative development, because then we have user feedback. So this is when we do a shitload of A-B testing and, and, and split testing and configuration and checking target audience and all that. Uh, then it's about incremental improvement of the game that we already measured that it's good enough that it's worthwhile investing in. So, and when I put names on these three phases or the mindset, then I think the first one basically is the mindset of lean startup. So classic Scrum Fox is it's not cutting it. It's more about the you need to be able to throw everything away that you worked on because it's just not good enough and start over. It's kind of like this pivoting all the time in extremely uh, quick duration. And once we are alive, then it's classic agile. And, and most teams get Scrum and some it's Kanban that we do stand. But in this phase in the middle, where we need to follow a plan and we do not have any feedback, waterfall is the right mindset for that. Because we had all that phase before to basically decide what we want to build, then we even have maybe two months to formulate a plan, come up with a work breakdown structure, and then we just execute on that thing. Wrapping this up. I do love Agile. 
please don't hurt me. Um, so, but when you zoom out a bit, so the team itself uses agile tools and values throughout the whole process. That's still the same. But when you step two kilometers away and look at it from a very high level, um, then basically we define the product. So this is not on feature level, but it's a product as a whole. We use these first three prototyping phases to define what the product will look like. And we further define this in the pre-production phase to nail down like how do we want to build it. And then we just build it. And in that phase, on the high-level product view, there is no iteration anymore because there is simply no feedback. And then we release it, then we get user feedback, and then this repeat thing, then we finally, finally, finally can start using Agile in the right way. Because then we have user feedback, we have new learnings, and it's all about some iterations and releasing something every week. So, I still do love this book. And I still see that embrace change is something that is expected from us developers. But what I want to tell you as product owners who define our backlogs is embracing change has cost. It's kind of like you, it's not for free to change priority. It's not for free to change the order of items in the backlog. It's not for free that something that the developers build is not used anymore. I'm not talking only about the herd of a well but also like you bloated your code base and then it's, it's harder to continue to work on that. So from time to time, I believe, I ask you, I beg you, <laughs> the mindset of waterfall is the right thing to do. Thank you.